We are on the last evening of the series of four lectures on the subject matter of Armageddon. Now remember we saw in Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 that we are speaking, and, and this is the subject matter of this particular lecture, it says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now one thing you can't do is misunderstand these words. They are so clear. It's a kingdom that will be established forever. It will never be destroyed. Very clear terms. And God's going to set up the kingdom. And it's going to be here on earth to replace the days of these kings, to replace the ten toad kings, the ten kings. Now, the question you might be asking yourself is who and, and when and where and why and what outcome and what should we do? These are, these are valid questions. And we're going to try and address these questions this evening to see if we can, can, can focus our minds on these important questions. Now, we really, we, our foundation uh, verse for the subject matter, where the word Armageddon is actually found in the scriptures, here in Revelation chapter 16, verses 14 to 16. And we see, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, of the whole earth, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew town Armageddon. Now we see the common point here is kings. Kings are being gathered, just like we had those ten kings, the days of these kings. And they gathered to what place? To a place which has a Hebrew name. Okay, and that's important. It wasn't somewhere else in the could be some any, it could be anywhere in the Bible we established from previous talks that it's in Israel. Somewhere in Israel is Armageddon. Now what we're going to find is who's involved in Armageddon. Who are the, who are the, who are the parties? I mean, here we have them. Here we have Israel, Gog, Merchants of Tarshish, and Armageddon. Now in, in, in Ezekiel chapter 37, it explains that all, that it says, I say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, where they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I'll make of them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Now, that's something we've only seen recently, since 1948. So one of the components required for Armageddon is the fact that Israel will be gathered back to the land. And that's something that happened in the last 50 years. Not only that, but here in Ezekiel chapter 38, we are told it's going to be in the latter years. Now, in the scripture, if you see the word latter years or um, terms like that, you can be sure it's speaking about the time periods we're speaking about here. It's talking about the events around the, the time period of Christ's return. And it says, And shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword, gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. That's exactly the situation we see happening today. Now, you won't say that Israel is dwelling safely, but by comparison to the way they have lived previously, as they have been persecuted all over the world, they're living a lot more safely today than ever before. But the key is the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel, the Judean mountains, that's a well-defined place in the world. And they're brought forth out of nations, and they're brought back in the latter years. All key points. Now, the next thing is, we see here in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 12, that, again, we're picking up a couple of terms here, that the people are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. And they are gathered, God's gathering them, bringing them back into the land for a particular reason, for a particular purpose. We're going to find out what that is. And that's an integral and very important part of Armageddon. So one of the who's that's involved in this whole process of Armageddon is Israel. Israel back in the land. And that's something we've only seen in the last 50 years. So these prophecies, many of these are over 2,000 year old prophecies. Ezekiel's 500 years before Christ. We're talking prophecies that are 2,500 years old. That could only possibly be coming true in the age we're living in today. Now there's another party involved, and this is Gog. Now if you open your Bibles in Ezekiel chapter 38 and have a careful look, it's a very carefully constructed chapter. And, and one of the important people we're going to find is called the Son of Man. Now we've seen previously that the Son of Man corresponds to the seed of the woman. 
that seed of uh, um, a particular son of man. And we're going to come back to understand that that son of man, in fact, speaks of Christ and speaks of those who are one with Christ. Set thy face against Gog. Now, Gog's a, 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 a proper name. It's a some person, a particular individual. And we're told he is of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So the, there's an opposition going on here between the son of man and Gog. Set thy face against Gog. So we have some countries mentioned here too. We're going to come back and look at these. Magog and Tubal. In, in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verses 5 to 6, you'll find more countries are actually named that are associated with Gog and his armies. And it mentions Persia and Ethiopia and Libya, with them all, of them which with shield and helmet, Goma and all his bands, the house of Goma, uh, Togoma, of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. So we now are describing an army, an army made up of nations, many different nations. Some of the names you might recognize, we recognize Ethiopia, we recognize the name of Libya, okay? but Togoma and nations like that, we have to identify where they are. If you come to the, a, a, a Bible version like the NASB, or many of the more, of the more modern Bible versions, they will have a slightly different translation of Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, verses um, 1, 2, and 3. Let's have a careful look at that. So in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, in the King James, it says the chief prince. Okay, but... In fact, more correctly, it should be translated, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, we're going to come back and understand who, was this, who is Rosh, and, and, um, and, and that's going to be a very important part of this Bible prophecy. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So that's very important here. You see this name, Rosh? I'm going to come back and have a more careful look at that. So it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old times by the servants of the prophets, saying, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? This is speaking about Gog in chapter 38, verse 17. So now we can be sure that this Gog is not something brand new to Ezekiel chapter 38. It's somebody that's been spoken about right from Genesis. That's going to become important. All of God's prophecies are speaking about this individual who is a leader of many nations coming against Israel. And this is something that's going to tie together many Bible prophecies. Now we've got Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, Bokart in Sacred uh, um, Geography declares that Ross is an ancient name from under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. So straight away, historians are pointing out who this Ross is. That's why it's so important to have that name correct. Stanley in the Eastern Church, on page 280, writes, the name Russ, Hebrew Ross, or Ross in the, um, in the Septuagint, unfortunately translated in the English version, the chief, first appears in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2, and verse, chapter 39, verse 1. It is the only name of a modern nation that appears in the Old Testament, speaking about Russia. And Gibbon says the same thing. Among the Greeks, the national appellation or name of the Russians has a singular form, Ross. So we're talking about Russia. Very important. Now we saw in previous studies that, that Russia identified themselves with the Eastern Roman Empire. One of the legs of Nebuchadnezzar. And why? Because when Constantinople fell, it became the, the um, power moved into Russia. The, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church, the seat of authority of the Orthodox Church became Moscow. And they took on themselves the, the emblem. Now, in case you're wondering how obvious this is for the everyday person, look no further. This is the 2010 Olympics. and <coughs> What's on their vests? Do you see that symbol? That symbol there comes straight out of the Orthodox Church, straight out of Constantinople. So Russia is identifying themselves clearly today with, this, with, with Constantinople, with the eastern leg of the Roman Empire. So, and we can see here that this is taken from the National Geographic of 1983, showing a, an ancient mosaic and showing how Constantinople has, this is the three Rome, but Constantinople moved to Moscow after the Turks um, um, 
destroyed the city of Constantinople. So there we have the two legs. So it stands to reason that in Ezekiel chapter 38, we have a great leader, Gog. We don't know who he is. He's still to appear, or he may be there already. We don't know. But he's a, a, very, a charismatic leader who is a leader of Russia. He is a prince of Russia. Now, we can go and look at other historians, and we can see the Magogites occupied the territory of Central Europe, and therefore forms the modern, la the, forms the modern land of Magog. Meshach is the ancient force, form of Muscovy, from which came the word Moscow. Tubal relates to the Tiberians, which gave their name to Tobolsky, metro uh, uh, the metropolis of Siberia. Now, these aren't my words. These are words from a, a, a collection of different historical books. And you can most certainly go and look in Google, or you can look in encyclopedias, and you will find the same information. When you compare Ezekiel chapter 38 to Daniel chapter 11, we can see some common denominators. Um, they speak of the same geographic position north of Israel. They speak both uh, of advers adversaries and invaders of Israel. They come at the same time invading the land, and the king of the north invades in the time of the end, and Gog has said, it shall be in the latter days, I'll bring thee against my land. So there's a lot of commonalities, and there's many more than that, in the actual chapter. The same allies are mentioned, Libyans and Ethiopians and uh, Persians uh, are mentioned in both armies, basically in both, in fact, in Ezekiel chapter uh, um, 38 and Daniel chapter 11, Lib Libyans and Ethiopians are both mentioned. And if you, the next point is, same hostile tidings come from the east and the north to warn them. And we're going to find out that the antagonistic power that's against Gog, or against the Russian Confederacy, involves nations called Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish. And these are associated with the little horn of, that antagonizes the Daniel 11 um, uh, northern host. They both meet with the same fate at the same time, in the same place, and by the same power. <coughs> They're all destroyed through the power of Christ and his armies. The Prince of Princes, the King of the North, is destroyed by Michael the Great Prince in Daniel chapter 11. So it's very important in Bible prophecy to look for these connections between chapters. We, may, we see these connections between chapter 38 and, chapter, and Daniel chapter 11. So you can see now, by, by using um, uh, Bible prophecy, we can identify what nations we're talking about. And here they all are. Rosh and Tubal and Meshach, Magog, Javan, Goma, Togoma. These are the nations we are talking about. The red nations over here. Libya, Ethiopia, Assyria. These are the nations. These blue nations are opposed to these red nations uh, as the Battle of Armageddon approaches. What we're going to be understanding now is that Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 9 states very clearly that these red nations, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So they all come down descending upon Israel. So that's very clear language in Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 9. And we saw that that Israel is therefore a key part of this um, attack by the Gogian um, hosts, by the Russian confederacies. Now, as we say, it's not just Eastern Europe, it's a whole of this region, plus countries down here are mentioned, both in Ezekiel chapter 38 as well as in Daniel chapter 11. We mentioned those blue countries. Now, this, is a bit, this requires some Bible detective work to understand who we're talking about here. The merchants of Tarshish, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions there are, are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13. And what, what, are the, what are these nations? They, they're looking to Gog and saying, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey? What's your purpose? Why are you coming down here? Why are you entering the land? What's your purpose? Now, what's in, well, obvious here is the opposition is quite weak. They don't simply say, okay, get out the land. They immediately attack. They're kind of trying to negotiate and reason. Have you come to take gold and silver? Are you, are you come because you want something? And, and, uh, Daniel, and, and, is, and uh, we see the same kind of thing in Daniel chapter 11, questioning the motivation. What's the purpose? Is it to, to come get gold or, or value? Now, the question is, is who is the biblical Tarshish? Now, that is where we're going to have to do some investigation of Bible prophecies and look at some history. 
Now, the first thing we can be sure of is in, in Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 to 5, it talks about the sons of Japheth. And one of the sons of Japheth is Tarshish, and we are told that Tarshish is in the isles of the Gentiles. So these, these Bible genealogies that you have in, say, Genesis chapter 10 are extremely important. Because what we're going to find out is Japheth speaks of the Gentiles, speaks of the European nations. So one thing you can be sure is Tarshish is a European nation. It's not a son of Shem, it's not a Semite, it is one of the European nations. That's important. So what we can be sure of is when we can try and identify who Tarshish is, we can look outside of the immediate area around Jerusalem and around the, the countries around the, 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 the Semitic nations. <coughs> Next we are told that Tarshish was a, a, a merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver, iron, tin and lead they traded in thy fairs. So Tarshish is a merchant nation and here's the important it identifies minerals, iron, tin and lead. And that's quite important. Because what you're going to find out is is that by identifying a nation by the minerals that come from that land, by not just the name, but what the country does and what they mine, you can start identifying which nation's been spoken about. Now, the key part about this word merchant, it has the idea of wide ranging. If you go and look at, at um, Jacinius, Jacinius says to, 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 to go around to travel about a country, specific to go around to travel about countries for sake of traffic. Hence, trade. So these are merchants that are, are traveling merchants, as opposed to just merchants that stay in one place. They are merchants which have wide-ranging travel. So that's another characteristic of this nation, Tarshish. And look at how wide-ranging they do travel. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with servants of Hiram. Every three years came the ships of Tarshish bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Now, these aren't animals indigenous to the, to the region around the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, apes and peacocks and ivory, these come from, from Asia or from Africa. So this is a wide-ranging uh, trading nation. And it's, it's a nation of shipping. It's a shipping nation. So we're getting more and more information to identify who Tarshish is. Now, Tarshish, if you go to the Bible, Tyre starts over here. So if you, if you are somebody in, you know, uh, where is Tarshish or Tyre, the first place you would say is right here on the coast, just north of, of Israel. But in Isaiah 23, verse 12, it's predicted, pass ye over to Kittim. So Tarshish nation moved off to an island over there. There also thou shalt have no rest. Like many trading nations, they move. So Tarshish moves from, Tarsh from, from Tyre to, to Cyprus, effectively, modern-day Cyprus. And, and Rollins, in ancient history, says, Carthage in Africa over here was a colony from Tyre, the most renowned city at that time. So the next thing we see is they're not, they didn't have rest here. They moved from Alexandria across here to Carthage. Of course, being a trading nation, they'd have ports, trading ports, and they could move their uh, presence from one place to the next as they suffered <coughs> persecution. Of course, God's word had predicted they would find no rest. They kept on moving. Then we have... <coughs> Rollins in ancient history saying that they eventually ended up over here. It says Cadiz, which is right here at the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea. They end up over here, which is again a colony of Tyre. And Isaiah 23 says, eventually, Isaiah 23 verses 6 to 7, that Tarshish will pass afar off to sojourn. Tarshish will go somewhere very far away. Now, we don't know far away, but we're going to find out more information to find that out. So, the Bible prophecies say Tarshish would not remain over here, but would move somewhere else. And we could track this movement through historians. Now, here's a very important one. Remember, one of the characteristics of, of um, this nation would be tin. So Ezekiel's writing, and here we have Herodotus writing a hundred years after Ezekiel. And he's talking, he says, Of the extreme tracts of Europe toward the west, I cannot speak with any certainty. So he's, 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 he's here in the Mediterranean region, here in Greece. And he says, Of the extreme tracts of Europe towards the west, I cannot speak with any certainty, nor do I know any islands called the Cassiterites, Tin Islands. So he says, I don't actually know where these Tin Islands are. From whence Tin comes, which we use. So he says, Tin's coming from some foreign island. We don't know exactly where it is, some foreign place. 
uh, tin islands. And he says, that he carries on to say that, this, nevertheless, tin and amber do certainly come to us from the ends of the earth, from the ends of their known trading regions. So they, somewhere very, very far away is where the tin is coming from, outside of their region. So this is now only a hundred years after Ezekiel's writing, so we can be sure it's relevant. Julius Caesar, writing about from about a hundred years before Christ to about 40 years before Christ, around that time period, he says, the inland parts of Britain are inhabited by those whose fame reports to be the, to be the natives of the soil. The sea coast is peopled from the Belgians drawn thither by the love of war and plunder. These last passing over from different parts. So he's saying the people in Britain have passed over from different parts. They've come to the land from different parts of the world, including places like Belgium. And settling in the country still retain the name of the several states whence they are descended. The island, again, and we can key point, remember it's a tin island, it's an island, a coastal island, is well peopled, full of houses. And he carries on. The provinces remote from the sea produce tin, and those upon the coast iron. So he's saying the provinces of Britain produce tin. So it's an island that produces tin that is far away, and he's now identified it to be Britain. So he's, in the time of Julius Caesar, it's identified. At the time of Herodotus, uh, uh, which was 100 years after um, Ezekiel, that wasn't identified. But now he's identified where this tin island is. Likewise, another historian uh, uh, called Diodorus, at the time of Julius Caesar, so he's writing the same period of, uh, of Julius Caesar, he actually says, in like manner, the islands called Cassiterites, so he, tin islands, same name, situated in the open sea approximately in the attitude of Britain. So he's saying, these tin islands are here in Britain, in this, amongst these islands over here. Today we call them Great Britain, that collection of islands. So, we have multiple historians telling us where the Tin Islands are, and it was a nation that was, uh, that was trading with the Mediterranean region and would have been trading at the time of Ezekiel. And this is, sorry, this is Diodorus Siculus again. These are the people that make tin, which, again, so speaking of the same people, then they beat it into four square pieces the size of dice and cart it to a British island, this little island over here. For at low tide, all being dry between them and the island, they convey it in court, carts, an abundance of tin. And why would they do that? They'd bring it out here so that these ships here could, could carry that tin all over the wind, world. So it was, uh, tin was, was um, uh, mined inland and brought to the coast and then taken to this little St. Michael's Mount, which is a place you can go to today. And, and that's where the ships would carry that tin throughout the world. The, the, the world, of course, being the, the Roman world at that time. So, now to modern history. In 1998, we have this announcement in archaeology. It says, The closure in March of South Crofty Tin Mine in Cornwall, the last operating tin mine in Europe, was widely reported last mine month as marking the end of an era. Very clear. It's the last operating tin mine in Europe. So this was, again, is a long history. But look at what he goes on to say. He says, <coughs> represents the end of an activity that has probably taken place in Cornwall for over 3,500 years since tin bronze came into the world circulation in Britain, into wide circulation in Britain by 1500 BC at the latest. That's 1,000 years before Ezekiel <coughs> was writing his prophecies in 500, approximately 500 years before Christ. So, well, what information do we have about the latter-day Tarshish? Well, what is this? This is the, the coat of arms for Britain. And what has it got on it? Lions. So we've got another thing. Because remember that Tarshish and the young lions, Tarshish is identified as being a lion nation. It has young lions associated with it. We saw it from Ezekiel chapter 38. So what do we have? An island nation symbolized by a lion, a European nation, producing tin in Ezekiel's time, distant from Israel, 
Merchants using ships, Britain remains one of the largest merchant trading nations and banking and, and aircraft and all those things associated with merchants. Trade in the same region historically as Britain does. So Britain had wide-ranging trading and continues to be a wide-ranging trading nation. That's got to be pretty conclusive proof of who Tarshish is. Why is this all so important? Well, we'll come to look at that next. Associated with Tarshish are the young lions. It says, Sheba Didan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. Remember we saw that? So now we're going to see nations which are going to be identified as young lions. Now, these young lions aren't baby lions. If you look at the, again, back to Decinius, the, these, are, these are young hunting lions. So it's a mother lion or parent lion and hunting lions. That's going to become very important. Not baby lions that are still being weaned, but hunting lions, young lions that, that raven and devour. Now, here's a picture for you. This comes straight out of a poster from the First World War, depicting England, the old lion, calling the young lions of the empire to the world. This is not a, a Bible student's poster. This is a poster put out by the British government. And it's calling who? Enlist now. Helped by the young lions, the old lion defies the foes. And here the young lions are right over here. So the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. Who are these young lions sitting over here? What nations are we speaking about? Well, there's the answer. Canada. There's one of the lions, the, the mother lion, England, Australia, and, and right over here we have the United States. That's why we speak English today. And, and of course, Britain and the United States have had a long ongoing relationship in, in when it comes to war in the last century. What we have to understand next is we're going to bring all these different groups together. So remember in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 8, we come back to understanding Israel. Remember we saw that it says, speaking of Israel, gathered out of many peoples against the mountain of Israel, which have always been waste. You see? After many years, brought back from the sword. So, that is an important part of this Bible prophecy, as we said right from the beginning. This is going to set some datelines for us. Now, if you come to another part of prophecy, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 9 to 10, it says, Surely the isles shall wait for me. Again, as, we, as soon as you see Tarshish, you always see islands, like England. And the ships of Tarshish shall f first to bring my sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the holy ones of Israel. Because he hath glorified thee, and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. What it's saying here in, in Isaiah chapter 60 verses 9 to 10 is that throughout the, uh, the Bible prophet, prophetical principle here, there's a close relationship between Tarshish and Israel. And Israel is going to help to bring, uh, Tarshish will be helping to, to set up the nation of Israel or intimately involved in the nation of Israel. We're going to see that that comes true in many different levels of Bible prophecy. Now, a, a Bible student like ourselves uh, in 1848, John Thomas, he looked at these Bible prophecies. Now remember at that stage, Israel was dispersed. The nation of the Jewish people were dispersed all over the world. In, 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 uh, certainly in Europe and in Russia and all over the world. And he was said, I know not whether the men who at present contrive the foreign policy of Brit Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the Holy Land and of promoting this colonization by their Jews. So he's saying, I don't know whether the current rulers of the country who set policy in Britain, I don't know what their intention is when it comes to getting Israel back into the land, to recolonizing. But the finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain which cannot be evaded. He's saying the Bible has prophesied, God's word has prophesied that Britain, Tarshish, will be intimately involved in bringing the people back into the land. And uh, this man here, Lord Balfour, 2nd of November 1917, as part of the uh, process of, 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 of um, the work of the Lawrence of Arabia and others, they cast the Turks out of Jerusalem and the Palestine, as it was then known, became under the control of Britain. And he says, 
here yeah, you can't read it, but I'm most certain you can find it on the internet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. This is 1917. Remember, we saw the, the prophe that, that these prophecies are thousands of years old, Isaiah and Ezekiel. So here, a politician is beginning to fulfill what the Bible predicted would come true. And of course, by 1948, we see exactly that coming true. So from the period from that time, 1917 to 1948, progressively, and then finally at 1948, they are brought. I'll take you one of a city and two of a family, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, and bring you to Zion. And Zion, Zionism, as it was became, was born. And of course, here's the headline newspaper of 1948, State of Israel is born. And it states, by virtue of the natural and historical right of the Jewish people and the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, we hereby proclaim the establishment of the Jewish state in Palestine to be called the State of Israel. And Bible <laughs> students just sat there and said, we've been waiting for this. Because remember, a key component of Armageddon, which brings Christ's return, is Israel being back in the land. Ezekiel chapter 38, to be on the mountains of Judah. But we have other things to look for. In Daniel chapter 11, remember Daniel chapter 11 and Ezekiel chapter 38 are the two key chapters that give us the, the details of Armageddon. And it says, at the time of the end, time of the end, again, key to tell you that we're talking about this time period at the time when Christ will return, immediately prior to Christ's return. The king of the south shall push at him. Who? At the king of the north. So the king of the south is pushing at the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. Very similar language to what we saw in Ezekiel, when, with the king of the north coming out, with, with Gog and the armies coming down like a, like a storm to cover the land. In the 1990s, you would look at the world, and that's how the world looked. So if I had to say king of the north and king of the south, and remember, king of the north and king of the south is always with respect to Jerusalem. So we're looking for a king north of Jerusalem, looking for a king or nation, a group of nations grouped south of Israel. And that's what we saw. NATO and the Eastern Bloc countries, Soviet Union. That doesn't look like it. It looks like an East-West conflict, doesn't it? That's the Cold War orientation. Now, again, coming back to Bible prophecies, which we can, we can have a look at, and we'll see some of them tonight. Um, back in 1848, it says, Again, speaking about looking at these same Bible prophecies, the conquest of Persia by the autocrat. In other words, we can expect Iran or Persia to become much more influenced, we can't say necessarily conquered, but much more influenced by Russia, as it's happening today, will doubtless cause England to conquer Afghanistan and to seal upon Didan that she may command the entrance to the Persian Gulf. Let's carry on here. Possession of all the coast from the Gulf of Persia to the Straits and thence to the Suez by which the lion power will not only become Sheba and Dedan, but also the Edom, Moab, and Ammon of the latter days. So what he's saying is, is that the lion power, Tarshish we've seen, must enter with the young lions into this region of where? The Persian Gulf and the Suez. Now, why? Because he didn't know exactly why, but he knew it would be in a response to something. Now we know what happened, don't we? What made... United States and Britain and the Young Lions suddenly decide to move around to the south and, and, and literally stay there. Well, that's what happened. The Twin Towers. After the Twin Towers, the situation, Afghanistan became the immediate response. The response to the Twin Towers was Afghanistan. An, an unthinkable thing prior to that. The United States remains to this day in Afghanistan, as could be foreseen through Bible prophecies. We didn't know exactly how, but we saw it had to happen. Not only that, but the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, Sheba and Didan, this region over here, occupied by who? <laughs> These maps don't come out of, the, out of Bible students. These maps come out of news reports. And, and now Iraq as well. All of this region occupied by who? The king of the south. So the orientation has gone this way. 
Russia disintegrates and spreads across like this. These nations all integrate together and the king of the south moves into the exact region as expected. Why? Some people thought that the United States went there for oil. Some thought because of Israel. Some thought in response. But we know the real reason. God's hand is dictated that this will be the way things will be when Christ returns. So can you imagine in your minds now, these are things that happened when? In the last decade. Since 9-11. I remember people saying, oh, don't worry. The United States will be there for a few weeks and then leave. <laughs> well, a few months, a few years. And change of, change of everything, it's still there. U.S., United States and Britain remain here and into this region over here as well. But most certainly they will stay here for a very long time to control what? The Persian Gulf. So, Going back to our previous talks now, we can see the whole picture uh, coming together. We see that in Ezekiel, it's talking about these nations over here, which correspond to the iron, brass, silver, gold nations that we did in our previous talks. That's the image of Nebuchadnezzar. So this image is now standing. The latter days, the days of these kings, this situation has occurred. These nations are united. And united against what? United against an opposition sitting in the south. The king of the north, the king of the south. Gogian image. And we saw that the image itself would, would be that, that, uh, from Daniel chapter 7, this, this, this uh, beast with that, the Roman beast, would split into two components, the dragon and the beast, and that's from Revelation chapter 12 and 13. And we saw that this dragon we saw from previous talks, becomes Russia. And this becomes Europe. So we have the two legs joined together. The, and this European being, side being centered in the Roman and that side being centered in, Constant, in, in Moscow. So we can see the dragon and the beast. And the image stands. And these two groups are going to work together. Now, if you told people that 20 years ago, I remember in the 80s trying to say that these groups would work together. They said, forget about it. These, these guys have nothing in common. But they do today <coughs> because that image stands. The, the Orthodox Church is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, influencing the people of Russia and the allied nations with them. So this is an allegiance that's growing stronger every day. United Europe, like we saw. And of course, the influence of the church, which we saw last week as well, which is influencing both groups. What we expect next is this point about taking a spoil. There's something that's going to encourage them to enter that region, and we don't know exactly what it is. But it's after, to take a spoil, to take a prey. Okay, that's what their motivation is. So it's to gather to, on, on the people of Israel. Now, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it could well be oil. It could well be the, um, uh, the access to the Suez Canal. It's a strategic region to be taken. Israel itself is not a poor nation any longer. But most certainly, if you can command that region, you control the world's oil resources. So that's one motivation. But there's another motivation. This is an extract of pictures. Brussels, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ukraine, Greece, Turkey, Iran. All these nations, these are pictures taken from newspapers showing anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, anti-Jewish gatherings. And they all have one thing in common. One thing. They are against the state of Israel. All these nations. And that's the one thing that's going to draw anti-Zionism will draw these nations in. That's the one common denominator they have because amongst them we have Arab nations. But we have Arab nations on both sides. In fact, we have Arab nations allied with the United States and Britain, and we have allied nations, uh, Arab nations allied with, with Gog and the Northern Confederacy. But the common denominator is anti-Semitism. Against the mountains of Israel, upon, turn thine hand upon the people, against my people. Chapter 38, verse 8, 38, verse 12. 38 verse 16, my people and my heritage Israel, Joel 3 verse 2, against Jerusalem, 
Zechariah 14 verse 2. Now, if you're making notes, Zechariah chapter 14 is another key chapter, apart from Joel, which we've been to in Ezekiel chapter 38 and Daniel chapter 11. Another key chapter. We're using that quite a bit tonight. And it's against Jerusalem. It's anti-Zionism. Now, you know, you don't have to look very far. I just did a search before I came out tonight. I just did a Google search and I said, just to see. And it didn't take me long. And I had a whole page of newspaper articles describing just to what degree anti-Zionism anti and, and anti-Jewish sentiment is growing in Europe today and in Russia. World hostility. You don't have to look forward. Anti-Semitism on the march again. Front page of, of Time magazine. Israel termed racist state. Jews attacked in French anti-war protesters. So you've got, what, newspapers? Not obscure magazines. Time magazine. And media bias. United Nations. Europe. Churches. They have one thing. World hostility towards Israel. And that's what's going to gather everybody together. That's what's going to bring those nations down. Apart from the motivation potentially for wealth and for control of the region. So when they descend like a cloud, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Plain and simple. You can see this cloud coming down. These little blue nations over here trying to make some kind of resistance. And as we've seen in recent history, United States, Britain, economically, are, are really in bad shape right now. And uh, the United States and Britain would not be in a position to take an aggressive role. They might say, why are you here? But not be as aggressive as they could be and not have the level of resistance that could be have been possible even five or ten years ago. So, if we come back to now to Joel chapter 3 verses 1 and 2, we're going to recap on all the different Bible chapters that we've had around Armageddon and put the picture together. It says, <coughs> Behold, in those days and at that time, I'll bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. We've seen that. That's a common denominator. They must, the captivity means they've been brought back to the land. I'll also gather, God's doing that, all nations and will bring them down into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, Valley of Jehoshaphat is right over here. It's right in front on the, on the, on, of Jerusalem. Here, this picture is taken as you're looking at, the, at Jerusalem um, from the Mount of Olives. So right up in front here, we've got the, the, the Valley of Jehoshaphat region. And this means Valley of Judgment. And will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations. So these nations are the nations that scatter them, and they're the nations that have come to attack. In Joel chapter 3, reading on in the same chapter, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. As we saw was this, with previous talks, we saw the idea of threshing and valley. So that means that Armageddon, you know, the Armageddon being armor, heap of sheaves, guy, valley, dawn, judgment. That's, that's what we're talking about. And again, Revelation chapter 16, <coughs> the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Armageddon. Key chapters. All saying the same thing. And where are we? At Jerusalem. Now, we add another component to it. We haven't been to Zechariah chapter 14 verses 3 to 5, but let's have a careful look at what that says. It says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. So it's important who's doing the fighting now. As when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now, we can do some Bible study. And we're going to find out these saints speak of those who have been given immortality, who have been judged by Christ. So this is, has to happen after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, after the resurrection of those who are responsible, and then being given immortality. Because Christ is standing on this mount, his feet standing, but he's not alone. He's with the saints. Remember, Christ said that he would come back to that place. He told his disciples that when he ascended. He ascended from where? From the Mount of Olives. He said he would come back. He would, the same place, he would be back there again. And to do what? To judge and to fight. And the saints. I mean, have a, if you go through Bible prophecies, you'll find it's very, very consistent. It's not, this is talking about those who have been given immortality, who have been resurrected to be with Christ. So, Prior to this point, there has to be a resurrection and a judgment and a giving of immortality. 
We could have known that anyway from, uh, from Revelation chapter 16. Because remember, Revelation, here's Armageddon, Revelation 16 verse 16. And here's the great battle of God Almighty. But between, we've got this key verse, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. <coughs> Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. So we have to be ready keeping your garments, spiritual garments. You have to be prepared for Christ's return. And you have to, that's, there's a blessing. If you're not ready, you're naked. That's really important. There's a blessing to be ready for this great day of God Almighty. Let me see the, there's another key phrase. If you say the word great day of God Almighty, you can be sure it's that one great day when judgment will commence and, uh, and, and pass over the whole world. And Armageddon, the titles of the, the, the subject matter of our talks. So, again, if you read in Daniel chapter 11, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, we have the invasion by the northern power. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 45, the invader occupies God's holy mountain. At that time, the world is plunged into, in, into incredible trouble. In chapter 12, verse 1, Michael stands up, which speaks of Christ. He was like God. And the resurrection takes place in, Revelation, uh, in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. So whether you go to Revelation, whether you go to Daniel, you'll find that the resurrection... And those who are given immortality are at the same time, right in, in amongst these events. Now, we don't have time, but I'm certainly, anybody who would like to have these Bible references, um, you're welcome to come get them from me, and I can certainly make a printout of this for anybody who would like to see it. But if you go to these chapters, Daniel, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, Habakkuk chapter 3, <coughs> Isaiah 19, Psalm 68, Zechariah 9, and here, Zechariah chapter 14, you'll find that the, the scripture gives us a pretty clear view of what will happen. It indicates that, that probably somewhere in this region, those that have been resurrected and been given uh, to, to the judgment seat of Christ will be judged in this region and given immortality. We can't say specifically exactly where, but it's something much like the people of Israel that came out of Egypt and then crossed it over past Sinai and then entered the land. It's a similar path. Well, the Bible gives many prophecies that speak of things that will be done by Christ and the saints, those who will be given immortality, prior to coming to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, Christ is with the saints when the judgment occurs and when Armageddon occurs, when the nations are destroyed at Armageddon. Again, we have many references. Psalm 149, the saints will assist in judging. And the Lord Jesus Christ is accompanied by his saints. We saw Zechariah 14, verse 5, Joel chapter 3, verse 8, uh, 11, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 20. And he comes from the south. We have that from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8, Psalm 68, verse 17, and many other Bible prophecies. That's outside of the scope of this evening, but it's important to understand that when we put these events together, this is just a quick little hint of another study we could be doing. We've seen how the armies have come down in detail, but now we're seeing Christ gathering his army to oppose those armies that have come against Jerusalem. We're going to try and tie all these events together as one sequence. To start off with, Christ returns, and remember, like a thief. The world doesn't know about this. You've got to be ready and clothed, and the dead are gathered, both dead and living, for judgment. Elijah, one of those who have been resurrected and given immortality, will lead a process, and again this comes from Malachi chapter 4, will go and try and, 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 and speak to the nations, to the people, not the nations, the people of Israel, to bring them back into the land. It's the Jews living outside of the land. Then what we've seen already, down comes the king of the north. And in, in Daniel chapter 11, we know he comes to Egypt first. His plan of attack is to come down here and strike here first. And, and, and why would that make sense? Well, Bible prophecies tells us it makes sense. But many generals have done this before, probably because they want to, to control the Suez Canal and control the region of Egypt. I mean, Rommel did the same thing in the Second World War. So it makes perfect sense to do that. At that time over here, Christ and the saints, Christ and the resurrected, or immortalized, will do it well conquer like we saw, and, and uh, sub subjugate the Arab nations in this region over here. Gog conquers Egypt. That comes from Daniel chapter 11. 
At that stage, the ship, ships of Tarshish are destroyed over here in the Mediterranean. And the Western nations then come from this side, from the other side, probably out of the Saudi Arabian region, and uh, coming from the east to Jerusalem. And Gog goes up to meet them. At the meantime, Christ and the saints go across to Egypt. And again, this is all given in much detail. I most certainly I welcome anybody to go through detail. Just keep putting a big picture together for ourselves right now. And the, the Jews flee. That comes from Zechariah chapter 14. We see a progression here. Christ and the saints, the same progression we saw, come up, cross the Jordan, just like Joshua did, and Armageddon occurs. So Christ follows the same path as Joshua with the saints, comes to the mountain of, uh, uh, outside of Jerusalem, the mountain splits, like we saw in Zechariah chapter 14, and the nations are destroyed, subjugated. Not completely, many survive, and there's a, and there's a process beyond that. And the fleeing Jews return to the land to meet their Messiah. Okay, and it's itemized in Zechariah. And from that time period, like we've seen in previous studies, the throne of David is established, and the nations have to submit to Christ's rule. Now, when I first saw this, I had goosebumps. It's incredibly exciting. Because we've seen all the preparation work required. The important thing is, is that remember, some of these events go in parallel. So we have to be careful because we have to be ready and clothed ahead of some of these events. In other words, we can't wait for the armies to be in Jerusalem. We can't wait for Armageddon. That'll be too late. What's really important in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, is to go through the key points here. What will Armageddon achieve? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Again, that's a hint that always you'll find every one of these prophecies speaks of a particular day. What happens? Verse 2, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Very clear. What nations? The red nations, the, 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 <laughs> the Gogian, the king of the north, and the king of the south, but the king of the south will not be able to oppose the king of the north. Then verse 3, then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand upon the mountain of olives. And the mountains will cleave. And the result? This is the most important part. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Yahweh, one Lord, and his name one. The earth will be filled with God's purpose and character. That's the result. That's the why Armageddon. So we've answered the when. We've answered the who. We've asked the why. We've answered all these questions for ourselves. And what will the result be? In Joel chapter 3, verse 14, again, the day of the Lord. Again, we always have to look for these key phrases. Multitudes, multitudes. Valid decision for the day of the Lord. The same thing we saw in Zechariah chapter 14. Verse 16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will or Yahweh will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and no stranger shall pass through her any more. Now why do we have this picture? Right now, there's the wailing wall, <laughs> and there's a mosque. So, that's where the temple's meant to be. That's just the foundation wall of the temple. It's not holy today. Something has to change. Jerusalem has to change. And that's what's going to happen as a result of these judgments, as a result of Christ's return. And not only that, but look what it says here in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many nations shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he'll teach us of his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. That's the final result. No more war. Nations will have to learn. They'll have to learn about the word. It will go from Jerusalem. This is something that will be the result of this Armageddon and the kingdom being established. 
So like we said, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. That's the key element, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the key part of Armageddon. That is, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is the focal point of the prophecy. That's what we have to be ready for. It's that's the stone that cut out of the mountain without hands that smotes the image on the feet. <coughs> it's that that shatters the image and, and like a threshing floor. Like the, the Armageddon means that, a, 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 a threshing in a valley. And the wind blows away all that influence. And the stone grows. That's the kingdom growing. Christ's rulership expanding over the whole world like a whole mountain. In Ezekiel, if you keep reading in Ezekiel, after chapter 38, it describes a temple. Many chapters used to describe a temple that will be set up where Jerusalem is today. And that will create, there will be worship all over the world as a result, like we saw in Zechariah chapter 14. So, the outcome is pretty simple and very straightforward. Something anticipated right from Genesis. The Son of Man, set thy face against Gog and prophesy against him. There's two antagonists, the Son of Man, Ben Adam, seed of the woman, Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, on the one side, and the Prince of Rosh, the head of the serpent, depicting all of man's thinking, confederacy on the other. The serpent's head is bruised by the woman's seed. The head is crushed. That's the outcome. So that's what we've been talking about. In the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. It will consume all these kingdoms, and stand forever. So forget about the nonsense of the newspapers and, 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 the, uh, and, and movies. Forget about this nonsense. That's just nonsense. What we have is a very clear progression of events that results in God's kingdom on earth. Thy kingdom come, that thy will be done on earth. So we go right back to the first talk we gave. The first in the series of four. In the beginning, why? And how? And the answer is very simple. The why? For the earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the result. That's going to be commencing at Armageddon and continuing until that stone fills the whole earth until the whole world is one kingdom. And knowledge fills the earth. The kingdoms we see in Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And we saw that the kings of the days of those kings, when the stone hits the image, God establishes a kingdom that will never be destroyed, that will stand forever. When? That's the final question we wanted to answer. It says, the time of this ignorance, speaking about man not knowing God's purpose, God is winked at, God has ignored ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. You've got to have your clothes on. You can't be standing naked at Christ's return. Because he's appointed a day in which you are judged this world in righteousness. So there's a day. It's on the calendar. We don't know exactly. But there is a day. It's not going to shift. And it's getting very, very close. And why? He's assuring. He's given assurance to us and that he has raised Christ from the dead. He is going to be the judge and that God has assured us. He's proven to us by resurrection from the dead. Now, when? The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verse 27, And when you shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power, and says, And then shall you see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Speaking of Christ's return and his power and glory when he comes to judge the world and establish his, his, his kingdom upon earth. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. So we've seen all these signs. When you see these things begin to come to pass, get ready. So the when is all the signs we've seen. Israel, king of the north, king of the south, everything, all coming together. What should be our response? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned.